All right, hello, and we are live for episode 12 of the World Map Podcast, your weekly dosage of everything in the world uh, that could be on the map in terms of nerdery, including video games, movies, TV shows, technology, comic books, audio books, and maybe even wiener dogs. Yes, that's right. Those of you joining us for the live show this week, my dog is here. Uh, I'm one of your hosts, Josh. Uh, joining me, as always, from his villainous mountain cave hideout is the one and the only, everyone's favorite Captain Treasure Tracker, Nick. <laughs> Hello. Hello there. Uh, the dog is actually here to replace Clark, uh, who's who's not here. He's, he's missing this week, so we're kind of like uh, two Luigi's looking for our Mario who's missing. But, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Did you ever play that game, Mario is Missing? It's awful. I couldn't play very far into it. It was <laughs> terrible. <laughs> well, today we're going to play a little game of Clark is Missing. Uh, but we'll, we'll carry on anyway. Uh, so I guess we can go ahead and, and talk a little bit about what we've been playing this week and get the show started in a little segment we like to call The Backlog. So, Nick, uh, we talked last week about Rocket League, and, and, and uh, Clark and I talked about how much we loved it. I don't think you had tried it yet at that point, or maybe you had just played a, a little bit of it. Uh, but the three of us had the opportunity last night to spend a couple hours playing Rocket League. And I dare to say it's uh, one of the most fun multiplayer experiences I have had in a very, very long time. It's a very, uh, it's a very daring thing to say. But I would have to agree. <laughs> <laughs> I did not get to play it last week. I just downloaded it, but haven't got to hadn't got to start it up. So shortly after the episode last week, I did fire it up, and it it was exactly as you guys said. Really quirky, kind of kind of off the wall, but it had that addicting quality. That's just like, why, why am I playing this? Oh yeah, because it's awesome. One, one of those, and it's, it's just one of them short match, quick fun. You can jump in, jump out. I think it's harder to jump out because once once you get in it, you're, you're <laughs> gonna play. It for a while, no matter how short the matches are. But yes, I would agree that the other day the three three of us playing together that was had to have been one of the best multiplayer experiences I've had in a while. Yeah, and and I've played you know with randoms online quite a bit on in that game actually, but. Uh, yeah, bringing two other folks who you actually know who are pretty hardcore gamers into it and uh, being in a party so you've got the voice chat going to really be able to coordinate strategy, it just makes that game even more fun than it, than it already is. And, it, and it's pretty darn fun uh, just by itself. Uh, but, but we had, man, we had a really great run. I think we must have played uh, about six matches, and I think we won all but, all but one of them. And the the team who who beat us, I think, on their second match against us, uh, we we chose to replay them, demolish them, and then the rest of the night they just kept trying to, uh, you know, they kept voting for a rematch, and and we certainly obliged, uh, but we continued to dominate them all night, and and we never did let them get another win on us, and so uh, a lot of fun, but just just the crazy crazy things that can happen in in that game, uh, you know random bouncing the the ball off of the roof or off of the wall of the arena and seeing you know what trajectory it's on and kicking your rocket boosters into play you know launching your car off the ground and and just tapping it into the enemy goal at the right minute there um you know centering the ball up and passing it to each other we had some pretty epic saves going on just the the moment to moment very um deliberate tactical execution that you can have in that game if you if you plan well and and get your skills kind of honed up a little bit just makes it so super satisfying i would i would agree i would wholeheartedly agree though the other the other night you talk about some of these smooth tactics clark clark isn't here so he can't you know grill me on this but i believe you will agree him saying oh i got this why didn't it go in when he shoots it like a hundred feet above the goal? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I will. Uh, I will admit that uh, his his hashtag not on my watch 
uh, campaign as goalie was much more successful than his, hey, I got it, I got it, uh, taking shots on things because, man, every time he took a shot, it kind of like chipped off the uh, the top of the goal and just went flying up. He was just a little high on, on each of those shots. But, uh, I mean, granted, he know. did shoot for the goal almost every time. So he had good aim in the direction. He just could not get that that vertical depth down he needed to know where it needed to go. He yeah. was always too high. Yeah, well, hey, we every team needs a good goalie. <laughs> so so that so that's a journey and, and we had a lot of fun with that and I'm sure we'll continue to to play and talk about that. Uh, and I'm sorry, that's Rocket League, not Journey. We're gonna talk about Journey in a minute. Um, one question though before we move on from, from Rocket League, I think uh, your dad was actually visiting your your villainous cave there in, in the mountain. Uh, what did he? What did he have to say? You know, seeing the game as, as an outsider there for the first time. What, what was his reaction to, to seeing Rocket League? I think at first he was a bit confused, and I don't blame him. And into a game where it's basically monster trucks flying around hitting a soccer ball, it could be a bit confusing. But if, if a game or two in, it, it seemed like he was really enjoying it. At least, you know, as a spectator, he just thought it was interesting to watch and. He was really getting into it too. Like when uh, some of the ones where I'd pass it off to you, and you'd go for the flip to kick it in, and it would just narrowly miss. You know, he's he's over here like, mm. oh, you know, and he was really. You could see him, and then when you get it, he's like, yeah, you know. So I mean, he was he was getting into it. It was kind of nice to have a little little audience there, like my own little fan section. Yeah, yeah. Your dad was was the cheerleader for the team there. Uh, yeah, well, I, I think just, you know, him being that into it, uh, just kind of seeing it for the first time as, as an outsider uh, is a testament, you know, to just how exciting it is. I, I, I do think that this would be a great candidate for one of those games, you know, that you see at tournaments and things like that. Uh, a lot of skill and intricacy involved, and then it's just a fun spectator sport, too. I think I think Clark made the comment last night, like, why isn't this a real sport? <laughs> to which we replied, uh, blowing, up, blowing up the cars might be murder. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know. Uh, I think there was a suggestion certainly. of bicycles instead of cars. I, th- I think that was my suggestion, yeah. We could just do, do it on bicycles, which, which might be a, a little more difficult. But uh, certainly fun to watch nonetheless. Um, yeah, so, so moving on, I mentioned Journey. I wanted to talk about that this week. That's a game that's been in my backlog for a long time. Uh, that I that I finally cleared out this week, and ever since I believe it was 2012, both IGN and GameSpot uh, they named this their 2012 Game of the Year, and I am a little taken aback now that I have played Journey because I'm not quite sure um, I'm not quite sure it's Game of the Year material. I'm not even quite sure it's uh, indie game of the year material. I'd have to go back and look and see what else came out in 2012, but I'm sure there are things that I had a lot more fun with uh, than I had with Journey. So, you know, for anyone who isn't familiar with Journey, I think every a lot of gamers know the basic concept, even if they haven't played it. It's a game by uh, Genova Chin of that game company, uh, who you might know for Flower, um, which beautiful, beautiful game, very relaxing game, Flower. Uh, and, and this is, you know, a, another game from, from the same team there. Uh, and in this game, you kind of start out as a wanderer in a desert, and you're sort of surfing through the sand, and you're walking through sand, and eventually through uh, lots of other environments too, you know, water and uh, snow and, and whatever. And you're really, you literally are taking a journey. There's a mountain you can see in the distance. Um, and so the entire game is just walking through these levels uh, to get closer and closer to the, the peak of that mountain. Unfortunately, the game's really boring, though, and, and really slow, and there really aren't that many game mechanics involved. You know, you, uh, you can fly, but only it's more of a float and really only a little bit at a time if you happen to be near one of the little ribbons or, uh, that's in the game environment. You can touch one of those and get a little bit of power to fly with. And then you can push a button where you sing, and that activates certain things in the environment, the little singing noise you can make. And that's really the only form of communication in the entire game. And what the game does is it randomly pairs you up with anyone else who's online playing the game. And so your character and their character are going through this entire journey together and kind of supposed to develop a little bit of a bond. You know, the game only takes two to three hours to, to play through. So 
theoretically, you could play through the entire game with the same person. There's actually a trophy for doing that. Um, but but again, I, I just got really bored because I felt, A, like the game was stiff and slow, and like I was fighting the controls a lot of the time because I would want to move faster. You know, I could see exactly what I was supposed to be doing, but holding on the stick for as hard as I could, uh, the character was still just moving really slowly across the screen. And so that was just sort of frustrating and, and dull. Um, and, and just overall, I didn't have a lot of fun with that game, and I'm, I'm glad that it was short. The art style is interesting. The music is very, very good. I actually installed the theme for Journey on my PS4 uh, just to have the music playing in the background when I'm on the home screen. Uh, but overall, I'm, I don't see why Journey was quite so critically acclaimed. Uh, and I'm not one of these like dude bros who's like, ah, indie games, like here's another indie game, you know, these things are lame, like give me the AAA, flashy, you know, big Assassin's Creed, Call of Duty, action pack title. Um, I'm definitely not that guy. I don't need, you know, shooting and action necessarily in my games. I enjoy the, the shorter, artful indie titles a lot, actually. But Journey just did not scratch that itch for me the way that, you know, something like, say, Bastion or uh, Transistor would, or, or even the way that Flower did. At least in Flower, I felt like, A, it was a little more colorful, and, and B, I was doing a little bit of uh, minor puzzle-solving type uh, activities and exploration a little bit, whereas with Journey, I'm really just sort of following a point of light from from one place to the next. So I don't, I don't think you've played Journey, Nick, you mentioned, but you have played Flower, correct? Yeah, yeah, I actually uh, was really interested to hear what you were going to say about Journey because when it did come out, I didn't, I didn't have a PS3, so when it came out, I couldn't play it, but I did play Flower when I first got my PS4, and I, I really enjoyed Flower. It was kind of a, you know, in terms of a game with a lot of action, it was the complete opposite, as I'm sure you're well aware of. You just kind of float around, but like you said, it was really colorful, and I, I kind of felt like Flower was kind of whimsical in a way, Especially when yeah. you get towards one of the last levels when you're re, you know, lighting the city, I guess. Like, bringing it back up and, like, bringing color back to it, nature. I always thought that was kind of neat. So when I saw these reviews and saw these uh, screens and videos of Journey, it kind of reminded me of it. You know, kind of this nice, neat art style, big world, not a lot of action, and you kind of just travel through. And so I was kind of hoping you were going to say something more along the lines of some of these reviews where, you know, it's kind of just a colorful, fun, just kind of different experience, like mm -hmm. when I got Flower, because I was really interested into hearing what you were going to say, because I, I do like that kind of art style, that kind of game. It's different. It's a whole different feel, and I, I typically enjoy that. Yeah, and, and I, I realize I'm certainly in the minority with uh, not liking Journey so much, uh, you know, based on what I've heard a lot of other people say and, and what I've read and, and things like that, but... Uh, yeah, and, and I was the same same as you. You know, I didn't have a PS3, uh, so when this came out uh, this past week on PS4, you know, ported over, I was pretty excited to download and play it. They had a great sale actually for pre-order. Uh, you know, like doing the pre-download activation for it, and so you know, it was it was an entertaining few hours, but but overall, it just wasn't uh, very very fun. I I just needed more to do. Um, I really like all you're doing is walking forward and wishing you could walk forward faster. If I had to find one bit of saving grace in Journey, it would be the very few uh, scenes where you're sort of surfing in the sand. And there's one one scene where you're kind of going down this very steep sand dune and you're surfing for a long time and you can kind of go back and forth between some gates or whatever. Um, I, that was a little faster pace and like kind of fun to do, especially with another player on the screen. You're kind of crisscrossing each other and sort of racing down this sand dune. Um, more of that would have been much better than what most of the game was, which was just agonizing over how slowly I was walking forward down a hallway to the next thing. So, If I'm not mistaken, whenever I saw the reviews or most of the screenshots or little clips, it was of somebody cruising down some kind of sand dune or sandy, like, dunes, and that's what enticed me. So I assumed the whole game was similar to that, so I'm... No, I'm no, I would, I would say probably 10% of the game or less is like that, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. That, that's what I saw, and it, it looked really neat, kind of quick and a... Okay. Yeah. 
Well, so uh, to wrap things up, you've been uh, playing a little bit of uh, Super Smash Bros. On, on the Wii U still. And so I know we talk about that on the show a lot, but I know you wanted to talk about it a little bit in context of some upcoming uh, Smash news, if, we, if you will. So uh, let's, let's hear about what's, what's going on with you and, and Super Smash Bros. lately, as well as uh, what's this big thing you guys have on the horizon here? All right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so as as everybody's probably noticed, my backlog is Rocket League, which isn't very much, especially with how short the games are. So, as uh, Josh here said, Smash. I've been playing that, trying to practice up, learn some of these more advanced techniques, because coming August sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth of this year, Super Smash Con is happening in Dulles, Virginia, where they have every Smash from the original all the way to the new one in singles and doubles tournaments with uh, jackpot prizes ranging from three grand to 17 grand, depending on which tournament you enter. And myself and my brother, the one that I accidentally mentioned last week, but shall not be named from here on out, are uh, entering a team doubles for Smash 4 for the Wii U. So I'm trying to brush up on that for this upcoming event. And uh, Josh, I hear you're thinking about coming out there, maybe watching us I, win Yeah, that. man, I, I, you know... I gotta check my calendar, but I'm I, I don't think I'm gonna uh, have too much going on. And uh, you said it's the sixth through the ninth of, of August, correct? So, you know that's that's, true. That's, that's, that's that's all weekend. So I should be able to come out and, and watch you guys. Uh, certainly, Our tournament is uh, the seventh or not the seventh, the eighth and the ninth, the evening of the eighth and the morning of the ninth. That Saturday and Sunday is when we're actually playing. But I mean, you could come out there and hang regardless. Because they they have a bunch of events. They have like live video game music, orchestra, orchestrated video game music, things like Hall of Games where they give you like a tour of old school gaming, which is right up your alley as as mine as well. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's Hall awesome. Of of they have a quick play. They have free play zones too, where you can just play a bunch of old games that you probably haven't played in a while, and a free arcade where they just have a bunch of old arcade like Berserk and all these other random games probably there from the '80s. Just a free arcade to play. Along with trivia contests, costume contests, you know, of course they're going to have marketplaces for buying crap, and then even um, indie games. It's like some new indie games, indie developers are showing up, and you might be able to play some games that aren't even out yet from the indie community. So it's not just Smash, but that's where the money is in this uh, in this tournament, this competition here. There's a lot to well, do. I, other I think uh, you have persuaded me with all those points, plus the fact that it's going to be like five minutes from my house. Uh, I'm going to have to. I'm, I'm pretty excited. Going to have to find some time to come out for sure. That's awesome stuff. Well, hey, uh, so that's the backlog for this week. Let's go ahead and see what's been happening in, in news this week. With uh, I think I hear the news motorcycle on its way. So I'm going to talk uh, a little bit later about Xbox One, which we have yet to really talk about much on this show. We talk a lot about Nintendo and, and Sony consoles and, and handheld systems as well as PC gaming on this show. We've been, we've been a little Xbox light. Uh, you know, there's quite honestly hasn't been a ton of stuff to, to play on the Xbox. You talked about Sunset Overdrive a couple of weeks ago, which sounds great. Um, but uh, I, I actually recently got an Xbox One, and I wanted to share this week the, the story behind that, which I'll do in a little bit. Um, but, you know, the day after I got my Xbox One, uh, one of the reasons I got it was to be able to play Rise of the Tomb Raider, which is going to be uh, a quote-unquote exclusive for Microsoft. I know we were all skeptical. I know we all knew it was eventually not going to be an exclusive, even though they wouldn't admit it. Um, but then the day after I get my Xbox One, this news comes out that, yes, Rise of the Tomb Raider, the sequel to Tomb Raider, which was the reboot to the huge franchise of, of the 90s, um, Rise of the Tomb Raider is going to be no longer exclusive to Xbox One. It's coming to PC in early 2016 and going to come to PlayStation 4 in holiday 2016, which means timed exclusive probably one of the lengthiest timed exclusives we've ever seen though. So it's going to be a whole year from the Xbox one release until the PS4 release for rise of the tomb Raider. Uh, I mean, I'm still glad I'm going to get to play it when it comes out instead of waiting a whole year, 
But uh, I, I guess this just confirms that there's no such thing as a third-party exclusive, really. <laughs> well, now you're set for Halo 5. <laughs> well, yeah, and that was reason number two to get one, certainly. Um, other news this week, Hearthstone expansion announced. Uh, Hearthstone actually just added the Tavern Brawl uh, game mode a while back, as well as uh, some new heroes. Uh, so all that's been fun. I've actually... I had gotten out of Hearthstone for a while because I felt like if I wasn't going to spend a bunch of money to play through campaign missions and, and unlock the uh, kind of big boss cards, uh, I just felt like I wasn't going to be competitive playing. I really enjoyed Tavern Brawl because it puts you in a scenario that kind of levels the playing field a little bit, makes you build decks based on those scenarios as opposed to uh, you know only going off of the cards that you've either bought or, or earned through through missions various missions and leveling up so uh you get to use cards you wouldn't normally get to use so i've really enjoyed tavern brawl i'm looking forward to see how this new hearthstone expansion which blizzard has announced is coming next month uh shapes up uh it's called uh i think it's called like something tournament i actually forget the name of it right off the top of my head right now um but uh this tournament mode is uh, delivering 130 new cards to Hearthstone uh, next month. So I'm, I'm excited to see because I feel like they've exhausted like what you could actually have as far as stats and abilities for these uh, minion cards uh, and these various boss cards in Hearthstone. So I'm excited to see you know, if they've come up with some really innovative uh, stuff with these new cards or you know, hopefully not, but or is it just you know new characters, but using a lot of the same abilities and things that, that we already have in, in the existing cards? Um, 130 seems like a lot of original uh, content to come up with for me, but I hope they pull it off. And certainly, Blizzard has a reputation for pulling things off like that. So, so uh, Nick, you had some details. Uh, speaking of expansions, uh, Destiny's got yet another one coming up. It, it sounds like, and and it's going to include some kind of new mission and, and quest setup. Yeah, yeah, it's a. Uh... This is the first actual expansion I would actually say Destiny had. The other two, they called expansions, but they were basically just light DLC. This one actually adds a whole lot new to the game. But recently, in the past couple weeks, they've been dropping little things about the uh, new expansion, little details. And one that they dropped last week or so that I forgot to mention about was uh, their new mission quest setup. They kind of liked the idea. There were certain weapons in the game where you had to get like a low-grade weapon and go through a series of quests and missions to try to build it up to become something great, like an exotic. So they're trying to work out missions like that, where it's not you just run here, put your guy in a door, stand around, fight a bunch of waves, walk through door, beat level. So they're trying to move a little more away from that, and you can tell they've done that in some of the past expansions. But this one, they're, they're having a whole lot whole new setup where you kind of do different quests for different kind of people. From what it seems like to me, there's not a ton of detail on it, but from the way it's like we're moving in the, the game a little bit, a little bit less repetitive. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm excited to see. I'm, I'm still a Destiny fan. Unlike some, it lost some and gained some, but I, I'm still a fan. But new this week, they have this new kind of weapon setup where they've had. But previously, it's like, oh, you go to this Vanguard, or you go to the Crucible guys, you just buy weapons, and they're basically all the same. Now they've got kind of manufacturers, like Suros is a is a, an exotic auto rifle in the game currently, but apparently it's a brand of gun, and so they're going to have a Suros line where they've got a Suros rocket launcher. I don't know if they're all going to be exotics or not, but they have different manufacturers now, and they focus on different things. Like some will focus on the base stats of a weapon being pretty high, but there's not a lot of customization in fine-tuning and making one set of stats like really, really potent compared to the other stats. And so you'll have a good base set, and then it'll focus on some abilities, while another manufacturer may focus on you can turn range and reload up or other individual stats, make them more potent and you know useful than just having a good base set so I, I think it's kind of neat to see a little more diversity in the way guns are set up now in the game. But that they, they many haven't given a lot of information on it. Well, you know, I hate to I hate to be the Debbie Downer here, but but uh, Borderlands did that years ago with with the manufacturers. Well, I'm, not, I'm not saying they revolutionized the wheel. I'm saying <laughs> for Destiny, I'm glad to see they are doing something 
to make it a bit more diverse. Because Borderlands, yeah, uh, yeah, certainly, a lot, of, a lot of good stuff in Borderlands. I will not yeah. down Borderlands. It was, it was a fantastic <laughs> game. Clap yeah, trap. Just, just as you were ex- explaining all that with the, with the weapons, I, I thought of you know Borderlands, and I remember you know very specifically how the the various manufacturers not only played into uh, the weapons you would find and get at vending machines, but also in some cases the manufacturers were like weaved into the story a little bit. So um, yeah, very interesting. Little- I'm hoping to see a little bit of that weaved into the story, but I'm not holding my breath with that <laughs> just yet. Maybe in the future. It's a 10-year game, but I did like the core gameplay of Destiny enough to stick around. It kind of feels very Halo-esque to me, and I've always been a fan of that kind of shooter. Do you think... Uh, so you, you mentioned it's a 10-year a, a game or, or whatever, and, and there has been all this talk from Bungie of, like, you know, Destiny launched however it launched, and they've obviously been adding and tweaking to it over the past, you know, year. Um, do you? But do you think there will ever be a Destiny two, or, or how soon do you think we'll see that? Or do you think the current strategy of releasing these expansions and, and various DLC is working for them so well that they actually won't release a Destiny two this console generation? No, I, um, you don't don't quote me on this, but I believe I've read a little while back that a Destiny 2 is in the plans and will come out. I am not sure of when. It might reach this generation. They might pull some crap and have it more towards the tail end of this generation, kind of how Destiny kind of leaned in on the tail end of last generation. But there was talk of it. They're going to add a lot more. They're going to supposedly have all of your original Destiny stuff transfer to the new Destiny so you, I'm assuming that if I've got stuff on this, you can't get it on Destiny 2 when it comes out. Though, like I said, don't quote me on this. I, I believe I read this a few months back on this topic. I, I do enjoy how they supported the last system, and so I'm hoping this next Destiny, if they do Destiny 2 for the next generation, I en- like I said, I enjoyed how they supported last gen, but I kind of hope they drop that. Honestly, it was nice for last gen players, but it hurts current gen players, as you know, Destiny's vault size is small and limited because last gen can't handle larger vault sizes. So I'm sitting here. I've, I've actually collected every exotic in the game and all this other stuff, but I can't. I don't really have a nice way to store it all or hold it because last gen is it's limited by its hardware, so they can't actually, you know increase the size there, and they're, they're kind of pulling the Super Smash Bros. for the Wii U 3DS. Both have to be the same, which I kind of think is crap. I, you know, I have a new gen. Give me some extras. For yeah, yeah, they're certainly limiting the potential of their software by, uh, you know, making sure that it's also compatible with, with weaker hardware, certainly. That, that, that's for sure. So I, mean, uh, I like the idea, but I hope they kind of drop that in the future. Yeah, I uh, I would agree with you totally. Even though you know, I don't know if I'll even dive into Destiny Two, whatever that ends up being. But um, I I certainly agree that that uh, they should stick to stick to the new hardware. You know, make it. You know, they they touted this thing as the biggest best game that is out there. So you know, in order to really do that, they need to I think commit to to doing that and, and put all those resource. You know put all those resources to work that are available and, and the most cutting edge hardware. Yeah. Maybe even make it a VR game next time around. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well that, that's uh, so we did have, um, I guess one more piece of news this week and this, this I, I threw into our, to our news list uh, simply just because I found it interesting. I always find it interesting when you find out that, you know, celebrities who are like very mainstream are are gamers and and participating in the gaming community you know certainly a lot of uh you know we've had we've had uh you know martin sheen's voice uh in mass effect and we've had um you know ellen page uh in beyond was that beyond two souls that she was in um you know we've had like all of these celebrities as voice actors um, and, and certainly you have like the rappers and the sports stars who play a lot of video games, but 
you know, when you see a really mainstream celebrity involved in the community, it's just kind of kind of nice to see that and, and show like just how mainstream gaming has become. But uh, Jamie Lee Curtis actually, after the fact, <laughs> let people in on the little secret that she went to Evo this year. Uh, Evo is the annual fighting game tournament. Uh, that's where all the all the fighting game fans, so not me, <laughs> uh, go to uh, compete for for big prizes uh, each year. And Jamie Lee Curtis went to Evo 2015 as uh, part of her son's graduation trip, uh, and she cosplayed as the character Vega <laughs> from Street Fighter. Uh, and of course, that character has a mask. Uh, so she was there the whole time. No one knew that Jamie Lee Curtis was at, at Evo. She was there totally incognito, and then she tweeted about it afterwards, and uh, even said that she's a she's a pretty big Street Fighter fan, and that she had a lot of time, uh, you know, really good time hanging out with all the gamers there and everything. So, just thought that that was interesting, and I kind of wonder, you know, how many other <laughs> mainstream celebrities are out there, you know, cosplaying to to Comic Con as a Jedi, you know, wearing a robe over their face or something, you know. Um, I wonder how many of them have to have to go incognito to these things uh, to avoid getting kind of harassed by all, all the fans. Um, but an interesting story there coming out of Evo. Speaking of Street Fighter, real quick, I actually uh, actually got a piece of news on that that I don't know how it slipped my mind. Street Fighter Five, that the PS4 exclusive, actually ha they've announced a new a new fighter for it. Pretty grisly looking new fighter. His name is uh, Nikali, I think. He, he basically looks kind of like a barbarian type guy, long dreads. But what's interesting about him, he kind of reminds me of Wolverine. Most of his attacks are like slashes and like things like that, kind of like Wolverine would fight. So uh, since we were on the topic of Street Fighter there with that cosplay, I thought I'd throw that out there in case anybody wants to go take a look. He's got a neat little you know, trailer out for him to showcase some of his new moves. Awesome, yeah. Yeah, I saw, I saw that. It looks very cool, very cool. Um, all right, so as we move out of news, I just want to remind, we have a few live viewers, so just want to remind folks that uh, if they're watching the Google Hangout live this week, uh, you can participate in, in the Google Hangout by submitting questions, and we do have the, the Q&A panel open. Um, but for now, we're going to move on to a little section called We Have Hobbies. So... Nick, as, as you know, and, and I've talked about uh, when I reviewed Tarkin on the show a few weeks back, uh, I've been listening to all of the quote-unquote new official canon uh, Star Wars novels. So I read a lot of the old stuff, you know, back in the day, uh, 90s and early 2000s. I was really, really into the Star Wars novels, especially the, you know, the Timothy Zahn, uh, Thrawn trilogy stuff, Shadows of the Empire, obviously. Uh, the Rogue Squadron books were great. Uh, Han Solo's Corellian trilogy. I could go on and on. Um, and I was a little disappointed when all that stuff kind of got turned into Star Wars quote unquote legends uh, when Disney, you know, took over Lucasfilm. Uh, and so now we're seeing this kind of lead up to Star Wars Episode 7, The Force Awakens, uh, with these new canon, these new official things that, that Disney says are, are what we should believe now. Uh, and I'm trying to get caught up on as many of these, uh, these books. Uh, as I can before episode seven comes out. There's still a few more that, that I have to read, but and and one uh, that's really good called Aftermath that's really going to bridge the story between Return of the Jedi and The Force Awakens. Um, so I'm definitely going to read that one when it comes out soon. But I've been reading the ones, and I say reading, but really listening via Audible and audiobooks. Uh, been focusing on the chronologically the ones that happened first. So. Um, more pre uh, pre episode four New Hope stuff. So Tarkin, you know, took place right in that timeline. Uh, I'm currently listening to one that I'll talk about soon on the show. Uh, that's more in the Clone Wars era. And so this other uh, new audio book that's out is called Lords of the Sith. And and Lords of the Sith takes place um, in between I think three and four. Uh, and it's really uh, a little bit, um, a little bit of a kind of a prelude to the Star Wars Rebels cartoon that's uh, that's on Disney now. Um, so Disney is Disney is very much tying together the animated properties with the film universe with a lot of these books. So um, we're seeing a lot of Clone Wars and Rebels stuff uh, characters, especially pop up in the in these audiobooks. So Lords of the Sith, um, pretty good book. 
um, it takes place in two acts. Um, one of which is sort of in, in space aboard a star destroyer. And the other one, uh, the final act takes place on Ryloth, which uh, if you're familiar with Star Wars planets and, and creatures, Ryloth is the home of the, tw uh, the Twi'leks. Um, and, and if you don't know what a, what a Twi'lek is, uh, those are the Star Wars characters with the two kind of long, uh, tentacle like things almost hanging off the back of their head. So, so think about, uh, you know, the dancer in Jabba's palace or his, uh, major domo, uh, it, it, that takes care of everything, you know, and answers the door at the palace there as well. Um, so, so those are the, the type of, uh, creatures or, or species, uh, the, the, a lot of the folks in, in this book are. And it's kind of interesting what they're doing with a lot of these new novelizations. They're really setting the Rebel Alliance up as the bad guys in a lot of ways, um, because a lot of these books take place from the perspective of the Empire, or uh, you know the the Republic that has just become the Empire, really. Uh, and and so that's that's a weird kind of feeling to to be reading and and, and hearing all that, and to really. Um, analyze that though i think is kind of smart so we see these this dichotomy in the book between you know terrorists and freedom fighters right and you know if you if you really step back and take a look at it the early rebels uh going up against the empire were really doing a lot of kind of terrorist acts right they're trying to sabotage and blow up ships and um they're certainly not like totally innocent like they're killing people um even though those people are stormtroopers and whoever but um it's an it's an interesting uh, look at it, um, but the probably the most psychologically interesting part of this book is how it analyzes the uh, newly created Darth Vader. Um, this book takes place right on the heels of, of Episode Three, and so you see a little bit of Anakin Skywalker still shining through, and there's some of this internal monologue. Uh, that Darth Vader has, and you see that the relationship between he and Emperor Palpatine is much more uh, symbiotic than it is, you know, certainly it's Master Apprentice, but you see that there is still that inkling of resentment and uh, and things that, that Darth Vader has for the Emperor, and uh, the book really explores that relationship quite well. So this is, this is almost a buddy comedy, uh, except there's, there's almost no comedy in it, but it is, it is uh, Vader and Palpatine, you know, on a mission together. And there's a lot of scenes where, uh, you know, the Emperor and Darth Vader are fighting people side by side. And so you don't see that a lot in the films. Like the Emperor is typically in the throne room and kind of ruling from afar. And so this is a, a real chance to see Vader and the Emperor kind of team up and go on a mission together and, and actually, like, get into battles together. And so that... That's kind of an interesting idea. Um, you know, the only problem I have with some of these early books like this is um, the focus so heavily on these main characters is that, you know, nothing's really going to happen to them. I mean, at, at its heart, this is a story about an assassination plot against the Emperor. Um, but, you know, because he's in the later films that he's that is not successful you know, there's no spoiler alert there. You just know that um, that the assassination t attempt is not going to succeed. So the fact that the whole book is based on that um, makes it a little less interesting in some ways. Um, but certainly, there are some really some really cool parts that just make a lot of sense in how they explore the relationship that, that Vader has with the Emperor. Um, on the Rebel side, the main character is uh, Cham Syndulla. And if you remember, if you're a fan of the Clone Wars animated series, as, as I am, I think that series is uh, so well written and so at its at its core, just mature and a good Star Wars story. And I think the fact that it's like an animated series kind of throws people off and doesn't really get at the recognition from Star Wars fans that it certainly deserves. Um, but uh, so Cham Syndulla, one of the Twi'leks from the Clone Wars cartoon, is a central character uh, in this book. Um, and so if anyone is watching the current Star Wars series Rebels, on, on, uh, one of the main characters there is a Twi'lek named Hera Syndulla, who is actually the daughter of, of Cham Syndulla in this book and of Clone Wars fame. Um, so he's, he's really um, organizing the, the attacks and the assassination attempt here uh, against Vader and the Emperor. Uh, so it's interesting to see them tying some of these characters together. The, uh, the sound effects were good. 
Um, but I would say the production value was a little lower than, than what it was in Tarkin. The Darth Vader voice, not quite as accurate as what it was in Tarkin, but still I'm just very impressed at the fact that these audiobooks have full sound production, music, laser sound effects, you know, some voiceover work done in them. Um, makes them very fun to listen to and like, like you're just in that cinematic experience. Um, overall, though, I got to give this book kind of a B minus. Um, like I said, it's just kind of not entirely interesting, you know, to have a story about assassinating the emperor that takes place between three and four because you, you kind of know what the outcome is going to be. Um, and, and also the near the end, there's this ridiculously long if you're reading the actual book, it must be 20, 30 pages long, like kind of chase scene, fight scene uh, with, with Vader and the Emperor against these lilacs, which are kind of these arachnid uh, type creatures that, that some folks who are really familiar with Star Wars uh, lore will know. But uh, that lilac fight scene was just like so long and so uh, tiresome and uh, just, just went on for a little too long. But uh, I'm still very much would recommend this this novel. Um, I've just started listening to Dark Disciple, which I'll talk about on the show after I finish it. Uh, and Dark Disciple is one is one of these new Star Wars novels as well. I think it's going to be better than both Lords of the Sith and Tarkin. Um, it's really good, and I'm excited to talk about it when I when I finish it up soon. Um, so that's so that's it for the non gaming stuff this week. I guess we could move in to uh, offer a little advice to the listeners in a segment we call Call the Doctor. Oh, we got a new name. We do. We do have a new name for this segment. Well, you know, we were I think we were just, you know, calling it the advice of the day or something. And then I realized typically the uh, sound effect that I put in in post for this is uh, from, from StarCraft. <laughs> and it's the medic uh, from StarCraft uh, asking, you know, if somebody needs medical attention. So if you're... Yeah, you know, we're giving advice. We're telling people how to fix things, how to do things. Why not call the doctor? It fits in pretty well. So, Nick, uh, you don't have an Xbox One yet, I don't think, right? Not yet. I was I was waiting for Halo Five, basically. Yeah, yeah. Me, me too. Me too. But um, if you could get almost one hundred and fifty dollars off an Xbox One bundle, would you be a little more intrigued to pull the trigger? Probably. Probably. Yeah, yeah, me too. So I got a little story about how I uh, how I got uh, my Xbox One, and <laughs> I don't know where to start. So I'll start with Amazon Prime Day because we talked about that last week, and uh, we talked about how that was kind of a bust. I had my eye out for an Xbox One on on Amazon Prime Day because I. Uh, you know, I thought, oh, wow, Amazon's saying they're going to have these super amazing, just ridiculously awesome deals. Surely they'll have, like, a really good uh, deal on on uh, Xbox One, right? So, also, we have, we have listener uh, Tolga uh, saying hi. So, hello, Tolga. Hey. Um, so... <laughs> so uh, I obviously there weren't good Xbox One deals on Amazon Prime Day. However, Walmart had a really good deal in their little counter sale that they put up, and their their little sale had a Xbox One Master Chief Collection bundle for the pretty normal three forty nine price, but that came with a bonus controller and a bonus game of one's choice out of a out of a limited selection of, of games. Um, not any Xbox One game, but they had a pretty decent selection of them. <clears throat> so uh, I I didn't pull the trigger because I was like eh, it's still three forty nine. I really want to wait and like not spend quite that much money. I'd like to get it more down to the two ninety nine range to buy an Xbox One. Uh, and I had, I had heard you know online and and done reading previously about you know Best Buy being pretty good with price matching and with uh, you know being able to negotiate price a little bit with them. And, and I never really tried this tactic, even though I'd read about it online so many times and seen it on news shows about how retailers are actually, you know, pretty responsive to, to negotiating on price. So I thought, what the heck, I'll give it a try. So I, I logged into uh, to Best Buy. I did some email correspondence with their customer service. And the customer service guy, like, kind of told me they would match the price uh, for Walmart. And what I was doing is I subtracted 
Best Buy's uh, MSRP or their retail price uh, for the bonus controller and the bonus game that uh, Walmart was offering since Best Buy wasn't offering that. I subtracted that from the 349 price and said, hey, will you match this since you guys don't have these items? Uh, and, and uh, you know, I thought, you know, maybe this was going to work out because the, the customer service guy replied to me and kind of gave me the green light on it and told me to call a number to place my order or whatever. When I called and talked to the Best Buy people, they sort of reneged on the whole thing and um, they wouldn't they wouldn't do it. And so I just plain, like flat, flat out asked them, I said, okay, well, what's the best price we can we can do for for this Xbox One, you know, can can you go down to 250? You know, trying to trying to negotiate like down below what I actually wanted, knowing they would try to negotiate me up a little bit. Um, they wouldn't they wouldn't go for it at all. Best Buy would not budge. So I kind of was like, all right, I'm just going to give up until we get closer to Halo Five release. But why not give Walmart like one little chance before I do that, right? So you know, take five seconds to kind of log into Walmart. They have a live chat, so I could just chat like right there and find find out the answer. So I, I log into the to the live chat with Walmart, and I actually I actually have the uh, the live chat here. I'll I'll bring up what what I chatted with them. I'll leave out the the boring like hello parts and whatever. Um, but I I said so the bundle the Xbox One Master Chief Collection bundle uh, with with the Master Chief Collection bonus wireless controller and bonus free game is listed for three forty nine. My price point is two fifty nine oh two number I made up. Uh, I am ready to purchase right now. I have it in my cart on the site right now. Um, will you give it to me for that price? And the Walmart representative, her name was Amelia, uh, she replied and said, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm unoffer, unable to offer you the bundle for that price. What I can do is offer it to you for $300. <laughs> and I said, oh, that's kind of where I wanted to be. I didn't type that part, but I said, I, I literally typed back, that sounds fair. And uh, they told me to place the order. And once I placed the order, that she uh, would take the order number and, and issue me the refund for the amount uh, that it was over uh, what we agreed on. And I did it, and it worked. And like, it was so easy. Like, it totally happened. So I, I added up the, uh, the prices on this stuff. You know, the 500 gigabyte Xbox One retails for 342. It was the cheapest price I could find online. Master Chief Collection is about $36.99. Uh, Titanfall was the bonus game that I chose. That's about $19.99. And then a wireless Xbox One controller is $48.89. So that's a total retail value of $447.87. Uh, so to get everything that I got for $300 even, I saved $147.87. So I got $147 off my Xbox One bundle just by going on and spending two seconds uh, on Walmart's online chat. That's a, uh, that's pretty big savings. So if anyone's looking to score a new video game console, I highly recommend uh, try giving it a little bit of negotiation. And, and by the way, like I didn't get scammed or anything, uh, got free next day shipping. It was, it was here the next day. I've pl played it, plugged it in and I've played master chief collection multiplayer already. So, yeah, that's a steal. That is a steal. I was pretty pretty happy about that. I'm not sure exactly how I pulled that off, but yeah. So and uh, so that's uh, that's your advice for the week, um, Nick. Anything anything before we before we head out that we forgot to throw in this week? I can't think of anything off the top of my head here. All right then. All right. Well, in that case, I think uh, we can say our farewells to our lovely audience. I want to thank uh, the live viewers that we had this week once again. I uh, got quite a few this week, actually. Um, so thanks to, to all of you. Again, if any of you uh, are watching live and have any questions, just feel free to throw them in the Q&A there, and, and we'll address your, your video game, movie, TV, comic book, whatever nerdery-type questions you've got. Um, but thanks everybody who not only watches the live show, but also for all of you who download the podcast each week and, and listen to that on iTunes or Stitcher or, or however you might listen to the show. Thank you very, very much. We really appreciate it. We'd also really appreciate feedback. We'd love to get your feedback on the show. You can uh, send that as well as questions and comments to be read on the show to worldmapcast at gmail.com. 
Uh, you can also listen to the show live each week here on Google Hangouts on air. We'll tweet that from our Twitter account, which is at World Mapcast. We also post the live show link on our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash World Mapcast. So go give those a follow and a like so you don't miss out. Uh, and then finally, you know, one thing that really, really helps us out a whole lot doesn't take nearly as much time as you think, and we really appreciate it, is if you can go give us a five-star review on iTunes. That would be much, much appreciated. And you don't even have to review the show. You know, if you just want to talk about uh, some great steal that you got on, on, a, on a video game recently or you want to give us Rocket League tips, uh, do whatever you want to do in the review there. But, but the five-star reviews help us out a lot. And uh, I got some. If uh, any of the listeners, too, if they, if they would like us to try a game that we haven't mentioned yet that they think is fantastic, we can try to make that happen, see if we can grab it or get our hands on it. Maybe give you guys our thoughts on that, too. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a great point. Um, certainly, we'd love to, to do that. Have a listener submitted uh, game night, perhaps, would, would be pretty fun. Um, and uh, maybe next week we'll even record some segments, uh, or not next week, but uh, the week of the SmashCon, maybe we can record some live segments uh, from there to, to share for the folks. And if anybody's going to SmashCon, certainly email us and we'll be sure to uh, meet up with you there and, and uh, maybe record a little segment with, with some fans on the show. That'd be fun. Uh, so again, to tell, to give us reviews, tell some friends about the show. Uh, you know, the more people you can tell the, the bigger community that we can build and, and grow and have some fun here uh, each week. And that's about it for this time. So until next time we are popping smoke. <laughs>